I know that everybody out here has marked this day on the calendar as one of their favorite days of the year, right? This, this is one of the favorite times to celebrate our moms. Since my own mom went about 38 years ago, I have mixed feelings about the holiday. <clears throat> every, every Mother's Day for about 10 years, and I already confess to you that sometimes even, even beyond, it would break me up to celebrate Mother's Day for my mother had gone to be with the Lord. And uh, I even, even today, I often wonder if I could ask her a question. Because, you know, once they pass on to be with the Lord, the questions and the answers are over. You've got to ask the Lord and hope he opens up your, your mind and your heart to that kind of stuff. Listen, I love my wife and, and she's a great mom. She's, she's just not my mom, but she's Ashlyn's mom. And my sister, Sherry, has never had children. She's never been married. And she, I love her dearly. And uh, this is certainly uh, to esteem her as a woman. I'm all about it. But I have, I have mixed feelings on this day. <clears throat> I want to celebrate all women, all, all of the mothers, because you hold a special place in the hearts of all of us men, all of us kids, all of us grandkids, and, and you know, even half kids and all that. <clears throat> the lady who started this holiday, her name is Ann Jarvis. <clears throat> She started it in 1908. Just thought you'd like to know where'd this thing come from? Did it come from Bible days or did it come from somewhere recent? Now you know, 1908, Ann Jarvis was not a mom. She had no children, but she had a mom. And she thought it would be great to institute this day and to make it all about mothers. So this is how the day got here. It was, uh, her mother had uh, passed away three years earlier in 1905. And so she was going through something like some of us go through who's, who've had our mothers go off to be in heaven. I'm very confident that there's not one mom here today who has never seen a Mother's Day. You're, there's nobody older than 1905, right? Don't even go there. I know better. I hope this day will bring celebration to every home. Happy Mother's Day. When I plan to preach on a, on a Sunday to a crowd of people gathered in the name of the Lord, and I want to celebrate women. Um, I want to. I want to do it well. I don't want it to be done halfway. I want you ladies to leave this place, knowing that you have been celebrated and, and highly esteemed. When I when I think of the perfect mom, I remember s some stories of moms like some of you have told today, mothers that have really tried to shape the character in their children and spend time with them. Uh, my mom had to deal with sons that were with three growing up. <laughs> I had three brothers before she ever got her, her, her favorite daughter, which is my sister, Sherry. And uh, she, she had us boys, and we were rebellious. And boys are a little tough to, to raise. Anybody amen that? Boys are tough to raise. Nathan, you're tough to raise. I just want you to know that we know, right? <clears throat> Scott, you're tough to raise. You were tough to raise. Richard, you were tough to raise. We, and we own that, don't we? We own that. Well, my mom had to deal with sons. We were in church all the time that she had control over us. But, you know, there was a time when we weren't around church. We were in school. We were around the neighborhood. We were around things that mom wouldn't approve of and didn't really want us doing. But we did them anyway. And that, that's why it shaped us the way it did. <clears throat> well, I am thinking about the first mom. What's her name? Yeah, Eve. I'm thinking of Eve. Her name even means mother of all living. That's what Eve means. It doesn't mean the night before. I know her <laughs> the night after. It means mother of all living. But you know what? She had a, the, her oldest son. What was his name? Cain. Yes, Cain. Well, he, was, he wasn't the best of kids, was he? She kind of got through the routine with, with Cain. And uh, his big crime was killing his younger brother, Abel. Can you imagine her pain? My goodness. That, that mom went through the roller coaster, emotional roller coaster, right? Any of you moms can identify with emotional roller coasters? You know, up and down. Oh, going through the trouble. <clears throat> I myself have spent a few times in the principal's office with an unruly child. 
I won't say who because I have three. <laughs> and and one is still unruly. I don't know, not not you. I'm so, one of them is still unruly. Hey, you can't blame it all on Eve as a mother, though. You can't say, ah, it's Eve's fault. She didn't train him right. She didn't do something right. Uh, she, pro she probably did everything right. And the influence on his own character brought him down. Apparently, rebellious kids were a thing all the way back to the beginning of time. So you can relax, Richard. You're not the only one that was a rebellious kid. I'm, I'm thinking through that testimony. That probably was true. I don't know. You haven't told me all the deep secrets. <clears throat> Listen, I'm, I, I had my mother spend a few sleepless nights. I didn't kill my younger brother. I have to confess I might have thought of it a couple of times, but I didn't, I didn't do that. <clears throat> so I'm not as, as bad as Cain, but I'm, I, I gave my mother something to really think about, something to pray about for sure. I really regret any time that my mom would have been sad due to something that I would have done, especially in my years after she had passed. I really regretted any of the times that where I had behaved, that uh, she would have been sad. That's, that's, that's not my favorite thing. Fast forward a couple of thousand years from Eve. You're going to find a pretty lady, and her name was Sarah. <clears throat> she couldn't have children most of her life. She spent her life wanting to get pregnant and raise a child for her favorite husband, Abraham. Finally, she was able to, through prayer, through the plan of God, through uh, divine intervention, she was able to get pregnant and conceive and have a child. And what happens? God comes up with another plan to have her husband, her favorite husband, take that son up on a hill and sacrifice him to God. Can you imagine Sarah's emotional roller coaster that day? Her favorite pitted between the love for her son and the love for her husband. And he was pitted between the love for his wife and his obedience to the Lord. Maybe you can appreciate being put in a position like that from time to time. I don't count Abraham as a bad husband or a, a, a bad father. But his priority to God caused a great deal of, of pain for Sarah and his son. No, I do not think of any perfect moms in all of the Bibles when, when Mother's Day comes by. I can't think of a single uh, mother that was absolutely perfect and did everything right. But I greatly appreciate the last chapter of Proverbs. Maybe some of you ladies and men uh, are familiar with this last chapter in the book of Proverbs. A lot of wisdom in Proverbs. You read through the Proverbs, it talks about how not to be a fool and how to be wise, how to be conscientious and what to look out for in life that would cause you to stumble. And at the end of it, Proverbs 31, I, I had hoped to, uh, just a little rabbit trail here, I had hoped to at one time in my life is to write in my book of opinions, chapter 32, The Virtuous Man. I never, never got around to it. I may get around to it yet before I die. But I think, I think the women get this beautiful chapter to show what the model woman, what the model mom and wife would be like. So I thought I would bring that to you today to give you some inspiration. Proverbs 31, and it's verses uh, 1 through 31 are the, are the scriptures. And I'm going to say a little few things in between. We call that expository preaching. So I'm going to explain a few things, but it starts like this. If you've got your Bibles, your mobiles, or whatever you've got there to, to look this at this. In the new NIV, the sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. O oh, my son, O oh, son of my womb, O oh, son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, nor for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees, and deprive all the oppressed of their life, of their rights. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. 
Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. It's a wise mom, isn't it? Telling her son, you know, he's a king. She's trying to teach him how to be a, a good king. Lemuel is uh, Hebrew, and it means belonging to El or God. Belonging to God. It's the name of a biblical king, but we don't see his name anywhere else in all of the Bible. So it's one of those uh, proverbs that may have used the meaning of the name more than having an a, a actual person. The words of the great King Lemuel, the vision wherewith his mother instructed him, are particularly meaningful. That even kings listen to the advice from their moms. Moms have pretty good advice. Amen. Did you catch that underlying mom talk to her son? She said, watch out for wild women and getting drunk. That's what she said. How many moms are still preaching that sermon at home for their teenage boys and girls? Moms all over the world are still teaching that. With all of these equal rights talk in our culture, the daughters could use more instruction from mom on that subject too. <laughs> Got some smiles on that one. Okay. Well, let's just take a journey through the most famous chapter in the most famous book of Proverbs and find some wisdom for our moms. A wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Now, I don't know if anybody here has rubies or deals with rubies, but she's far worth more than millions of dollars. Maybe that would help you, or even billions of dollars. From the point of view of the man looking for a good woman to marry and make a family, wisdom says she is rare and valuable. In the world of priority, money is... Today, money seems to be at the top of the list to seek and to conquer or possess things. That seems to be the, the number one priority of what we spend our time doing. But the virtuous woman is highly ranked and more high than even wealth. We live in a culture of throwaway society. Amen? What I mean by that is um, uh, we go to McDonald's and, and we get... Uh, Fry, French fries and they're in a little baggie or something and what happens we eat the fries we throw away the bag we, we drink the, the coke or the, the orange juice or whatever we get and we wrinkle it up and it goes into the recycle bin right we take that whole bag throw all of our trash receipts and whatnot that we get we just then we throw it in the trash then it goes to recycling or wherever it goes to the dump from there well I mean even even more than that sometimes it seems like our marriage vows are disposable when life gets tough and loving feelings get covered up with stuff like bills that we can't pay or uh, trouble with our friends and maybe get in trouble on Facebook for posting something that people are hating on you for, right? That's, that's a thing. Sometimes I've heard from, from a friend of mine that people go to Facebook jail for you know, getting into trouble or speaking their mind uh, on Facebook. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, raising children can be stressful. How about a baby crying all night long? Boy, that'll put some tension between a, a, a mother and a father. And sometimes a babysitter. And then the endless arguments. Divorce has become the natural option and cure for our troubles in our relationships. A couple went to a church marriage conference one time. The story is told. The husband paid attention closely to all the things that the counselor, that the speaker was saying, that he could learn how to be a better husband, that he could learn how to show his wife, who's the mother of his children, how much he cares for her and how important that she is in his life. So one day he just, he just said, you know what, this is the day I'm going to show her that I really, really care for her and how important she is. So he stopped off to the store. He grabbed him a bouquet of flowers, probably roses like these. And he got a box of candy and he came to the door. And instead of just coming in with his key, he knocked on the door. So his wife comes to the door, opens the door and he says, hi, honey, I love you. He shows her the flowers and the candy and she bust out in tears. She was upset. The, the day came that the, the baby was, was crying all day long. The washing machine had broken down and somebody had gotten an ink pen in there and ruined a bunch of her favorite stuff. 
She had a crisis after crisis uh, during the day. So she opens the door at that particular time and she, t she told him all the things that had happened. And then finally, you come home drunk. She thought he was drunk because he was treating her differently. Okay, I'll, I'll have to not say that one again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there. there. So she, she thought he came home drunk, like he'd you know, been out doing something bad that he had to make up for with flowers and, and candy. And he was just trying to show her how much he cared. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. Yeah, you guys are still snickering that nobody laughed at that, right? That that story just went, went up. But that's okay. Donna got it first. That's well, Fred, she, he raised the flag. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll look up more sick jokes and tell you more later. Yep. <laughs> Won't be today. I'm all out of sick jokes today. So the woman, this virtuous woman, her husband is all about her. He's going to come home with candy and flowers or put siding on the front of a house. Whatever it takes to let her know that she is highly esteemed. In, in my language, in my love language, it's siding on the front of the house. The, the flower thing, you know, we, we take care of that here. But she brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. He, he trusts her unconditionally. You know, we guys, we're blessed to have wives who are, who are the mother of our children whom we don't have to worry about what their thought is, uh, that they're making a plot against us. We don't have to worry to protect ourselves and our, our perceived fortune or whatever it is we think we're working for there. We can trust them. And we know that, that the Proverbs said it right. And, and it is a life journey to consider her family first and supply all of their needs first both physical and emotional. Somebody asked me recently about, um, you know, becoming single again and looking at life from a single person's perspective. And I, I know for a while I was single. My wife and I were both single for a while uh, in late in life. And it wasn't something we wanted, but it, it happens. It happens way too often. And in, in looking uh, around or just becoming in a singles ministry at church even, you hear a lot of stories about people seeking other people. And I, I had uh, this one lady one time, she said, I would, never, uh, I would never consider dating a man who didn't have children because there's something about children that changes a person. And I think that for, for a single lady who gets married, uh, young, old, middle, whenever, that, and then has children, the priority switches from meeting their own need to meeting the needs of their children first. And that we want to exalt in you ladies today, in you moms today. She selects wool and flax and works with her eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark and, prob and she provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. The way the, I'm snickering a little bit, my wife and I had a conversation about this, knowing what we had all studied this and all that. But this morning I, I, I left the door open a little. I get up early. I didn't used to. Before her, I didn't. But I, I do now. And she really relishes the days when she doesn't have to get up in the dark, right, to go to school for, for you know, reasons that she'd rather not. Uh, she, I mean, she's such a, a great teacher and loves her kids. But sometimes those kids don't give her much of a reason to get up in the dark to come and to, to help them through their day. But uh, this, is this proverb is talking about the nature of a, a diligent mom, of the moms who take care of their husbands and their children. Uh, it talks about, does anybody remember the days not so long ago when uh, moms would teach their daughters how to make their own clothes? Am I speaking to the, to the choir here? Does anybody here get, get taught? how to make clothes or iron or, or, you know, how to wash clothes. You know, it's really funny. When I was a kid about Nathan's age, maybe younger, in the basement in Virginia, we had a basement. And in that basement, there was a, 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 a washing machine with a ringer on it. Remember those ringers? You know, we used to put, well, my, my dad, he'd work on something, wash the car. Then he'd ring it out to that ringer, sit there and roll that thing, get all the water out, get it kind of flat 
let it dry and be flat. Well, I, I, my mom taught us boys. She didn't have a girl to teach. So she taught us boys how to iron, how to wash with the washing machine, and how to dry, you know, and not get our fingers caught in there because after a while it wasn't the crank type, Dennis. I know Dennis is a lot younger than me. He probably doesn't remember. This. But it, if they became a machine, you could plug the thing in. And, it would, and you'd start that clothing in there and you better get your fingers out of the way because it would roll it. Well, she taught us how to do it and how to do it safe. And um, so I just, I have a little comment about but when I, I <laughs> when I was single for a while, I had, a, I had my own ironing board and I had my own iron. I know how to iron. My mother taught me. And I, I fell in love with this beautiful girl at church. I mean, she had, she, she had everything. She was godly. She was cute. She still is cute and she's still godly. And one thing I forgot to ask, you know, what is it? What's your, what's your favorite thing to do? Or, you know, in, in the way of housekeeping or all of that. Well, I found out very quickly as we designed our house, this is before we got married. I knew this married her anyway. She said, I don't iron. <laughs> I said, I wanted to put an ironing board in the in the in our master bedroom with a couple of things. She said, Oh no, uh, I don't need that. You can go ahead if you want, but I, I don't need that. And I thought, What? You don't iron? So I'm glad my mom taught me how to iron because every time I need a shirt, I go get my ironing board and my iron, and I go in that kitchen and I iron that thing. And you know what? My wife, she just buys things that don't need ironing, and so what she doesn't need to do that. Right? I love her. I love her. I thought that was funny. You know, a lesser man would have said, that's that's an issue. We can't get past it. That's a deal breaker. Not me. Not me. She um, she taught us how to cook. I don't do much. The last time I tried to cook, I know you got stories of this, guys and girls. When you were younger, uh, I was. she taught me how to make a cake. So in those old days, Washington cake mixes were 25 cents a piece. I'm going back now, 60s, maybe, maybe 50s. And 25 cents a piece. I think there was some, but for the 50s, there were 10 cents a piece, and then it went way up. Well, 25 cents a piece. So you bought two cake mixes, took two to make a cake, and you bought two icing mixes, which was also a powdered thing. They looked similar, but one said cake, one said icing. Well, Alan goes and gets so good at making cakes. Come on, Nathan, you're going to you're gonna identify with me here. I got so good at making cakes, I didn't have to look at the instructions anymore. So I just grabbed a cake mix, poured it in, grabbed another cake mix, poured it in, mixed it up, put it in the oven, and waited the 30 minutes at 350. Done it a lot of times. I mean, I was taught well how to do that. Well, the cake came out. It looked a little flat. It didn't look like it was going to supposed to be. It looked a little flat. So I, I, I didn't really stick a thing in it to see if it was done. I took it out. I went to make the, the, uh, the frosting now. And I, so I, I pulled one, one thing out, and I noticed... Wait a second, this isn't a frosting mix, this is a cake mix. And I had two two and two before. What happened, Fred? I'll tell you what happened, Fred. I put a cake in a frosting mix and cooked it for 30 minutes. And I'm telling you, don't do it. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't work. So anyhow, my mother tried to teach me, but I'm a hard-headed boy. All right, let's go on. Uh, she considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. This is the virtuous woman. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. Apparently, this mom is a very smart and talented woman. She is an alpha female mom, for sure. Capability, though, is neither male nor female. I wanted this is more for the guys maybe than the girls. Uh, this brings up a very sensitive point in our instruction on women and men and the roles that God has given us each, which is different. Uh, some things are the same. Have you ever heard the saying in business circles that say, do you want the man in charge or the woman who knows everything? Just not if you've heard that before. You've, you've heard that before. And it shouldn't be insulting. It should be exalting, right? That, that the ladies were called out, that they really knew the inner workings and could answer questions even more than the guy who is in charge. But in our culture, being in charge of a business or a political office, or even the head of the house means you are the biggest or the smartest, the most valuable in the arena. Now, that's, and that's in our culture, that's not in our scriptures. 
The insistence for equality in the marriage is destroying, in my opinion, the rules for living that God has given to the marriage, to the marriage couple. It's a mistake that has injured several generations of young people as well as destroyed so many marriages and families. I think there's a misunderstanding in all of this in our culture. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. That verse never meant to say that the wife was inferior to the man who God was calling the head. Never meant to say that. Even in Proverbs, it's talking about how smart she is to be able to handle money and be able to handle business. And she is someone who, can, who is very successful. The the second chapter of uh, first timothy explains that it is not about capability it is not that one is uh, over the other because they are greater better or any of that it is an order that god had the firstborn order adam was created first that's it there is no other reason for it uh any other reason would reject the command of god from christ in this matter the modern feminist movement worldwide is more interested in abortion rights and sexual perversion than the preservation of being a godly family with a godly husband and a godly wife. They're more interested in those, those things instead of making the marriage work. A mom is not called to be submissive to her children, however. No, moms, you're not submissive to your children. You tell the children what to do, they better do it, right? Or else. What does that or else mean? I don't know, but it's painful, I'm sure. I'm sure it's painful. It, it, and here goes Proverbs more. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. Guys, I, I don't know if you've studied this at all. The old time, the ladies of the past. I'm talking 100 years ago to 500 to 10,000. Well, it won't be 10. 6,000 years ago, they were doing the same stuff. They were making clothes and they were finding uh, the, the fibers from the sheep. They were finding fibers from the linen and they were making things with a, they were spinning it around a couple of uh, implements that were called that were called a distaff and a spindle. And so they would make stuff from that. Today we go to Walmart. It's already there, right? Any color you want, whatever you want, you can get that. I need something here. There we go. I'm getting away. <laughs> Keep flips on my page. So it was quite interesting. There was I went to YouTube. Anybody here use YouTube to figure out what's going on? I went to YouTube and I said, "What is a distaff and a spindle?" And it came up with a video, a current video of a lady who was very proud of her roots in the in the uh, ancient art of uh, making clothing or making yarn or making linen. And she had uh, what, what was called a distaff for spinning this stuff and keeping it almost like a, um, what it, what it, uh, like a, um, um, it was called a distaff, but it, uh, what am I thinking of? I'm, I'm thinking of what goes in the, the sewing machine bobbin. that you wind up, the bobbin, like a bobbin. It would keep the thread from, from twisting and getting all gnarled up as it came out. And, um, and the other was, uh, was used in the, in the uh, making of the thread and, and keeping it in one big ball. So it, it talked about um, doing the chores around the house that helped the family. That's what the bottom line was. This, this virtuous woman was, was doing what was necessary to keep the family going and to keep them fully clothed. And then it talks about uh, generosity, how generous moms are that moms do not like to see people in need. And when moms see people in need, the next door neighbor's kids, the next door neighbors, somebody at church or whatever, that there is a heart to help, to extend a hand of help. And that is so admirable in the godly woman. It goes on to say, when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes covering for her bed. She is clothed in linen 
fine linen, and purple. These were expensive dyes. They were for wealthy people in the day. The virtuous woman was keeping her family looking wealthy and healthy and covered. Her, this girl is a planner. She's looking into the future for her family. Her husband is respected at the city gate, the scripture continues, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. There's not a, 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 a man worth his salt that doesn't highly esteem not only his mother but his wife because it goes hand in hand. One can't be good without the other being good. It, 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 one feeds the other. I know what you're thinking. Behind every good man is a good woman. And that's, and that's true. And every behind every good woman is a good man. Apparently that is true. Ladies, let me bring you into a masculine secret, secret kept very closely by men. I see all the ears. Bro. Oh, he's about to tell us a secret. When we men look at our accomplishments and our accumulated wealth, no matter how large or small, without our wife and our family, it is meaningless. I don't know if you caught that or not. It doesn't mean anything without sharing it with our wife and our children. It doesn't matter how important we are to other people. The things that a godly husband and, and, and a father cares about most above anything else that may look like he cares is his family. And listen, guys, when we lose focus on that and we start thinking, well, if I'm giving her the money and I'm giving her this, I'm doing enough but we don't give them ourselves, we've missed out. We, we didn't get trained right. So it's up to the godly men to train their protégés, their younger men, how to be good husbands. It doesn't come naturally. With the wife and family by the side of any successful man, there is contentment and immense pleasure. Remember that. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Here's the summation of the proverb. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Listen, husbands, make sure you tell your wife how much she means to you today, or girlfriends, or people in your life. Listen, you older guys, older, older than me, a little less than me, start teaching the younger generation how to treat their ladies. You moms, teach your daughters how to love their husbands and not get caught up and swept up in the social craziness that's out there. It's not helping. It's not helping us bring up families in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. My hope for today is for the complete turnaround of harm done to our moms in the name of the family or politics or even the church or children, which wrongly define the word mother. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you as you find adoration and praise for the most meaningful title today it is mom most meaningful title and finally at the end of the proverb it says charm is deceptive beauty is fleeting but a woman who fears the lord is to be praised give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gates that does not sound like a woman who is put down by overbearing men or bullies or whatever. That sounds like that we can celebrate a feminine lady, a mother who cares about things other than wealth and, and she should be esteemed highly and the Lord esteems her highly. Happy Mother's Day. We appreciate you all. And so does the Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't really have anything uh, to announce other than I'll get back with you about the the opening of the church this coming week. I, I see Javier left, so I'll, I'll have to call him on the phone a little later. But I hope that you have a great celebration today and that I guess some restaurants are open. Yeah. yeah. So if you wanted to take somebody out to a restaurant. The Cracker Barrel was packed. Cracker Barrel was packed. That 25% was, was a big 25, huh? Okay, so I'll probably steer away from Cracker Barrel. We went to a little Italian place. 
the other day that was uh what's what's the name of that mario's Ma what is it romano's oh, yeah, romano's yeah. and it wasn't crowded and they have good food and they have good service and i'm sure there are others too or just go home and have a nice prepared meal do some takeout thank you moms i hope you feel good about having been here today but in your role and i hope you husbands now will be maybe a little more appreciative show her you know watch the candy and the and the the, the uh, flower thing it may backfire on you like it did this guy but try it anyway let's do it let's do it let's pray holy father thank you for your words thank you for your guidance through scripture we thank you for your holy spirit that is in us that guides us and teaches us all things God, we thank you for this little church and, and what might seem like a little bit of influence. And, and we've fallen on hard times, Lord, through these days of sickness and, and fear of, of getting something. And, and uh, we, we pray, God, that, that you will help us through this time to be even more brave and more valiant, to win souls for you, to, to preach the good news to those out there that uh, do not know about you. And there seems to be more and more every day. God, we thank you for the blessing of the Christian life. We thank you for the, the, the blessing of being here together today to celebrate Mother's Day. And we ask your blessing on all of our moms. Lord, let them know how beloved they truly are. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.